Uh, my name is Andreas Nilsson, and I'm the current chair of SECIT. And um, welcome to tonight's uh, lecture. It is an event organized by SECIT, and it's hosted by the ICE. And the title of tonight's event is Sellafield Site Earthquake Liquefaction Assessment. But uh, before we get on to tonight's, tonight's presentation, uh, I just have a few things I'd like to go through with you. Uh, first of all, a bit of housekeeping. Uh, there's very little housekeeping insofar as this is an online event. You can post questions in the box, which should appear below the window that shows the presentation. And I will then go through the questions, either reply directly to the questions during the event, or we'll go through them uh, once the event is over and we are into Q&A time. Uh, this, this event is recorded and it can be watched again at a later date. Look out for the event on the ICE website or on SECED's YouTube channel. Uh, I just want to highlight a few future events before we get going. On the 18th of April, we have an event called Catastrophe Modeling, Quantifying Current Risk and Modeling Future Risks Under a Changing Climate. And that is a lunchtime event that is organized by our young members. On the 19th of April, we have another event called or entitled Seismic excitation of offshore wind turbines and transitioned peace response. Again, this is a young members event, which starts at six o'clock in the evening. On the 26th of April, uh, we have our annual general meeting, and that is followed by an event, uh, an evening lecture, which is entitled EM Blast, Accurate Prediction of Blast Loading for Safety of the Built Environment. Then on the 31st of May, we have the one of the biggest events in SECIT's calendar, one of the most prestigious events. And this is the 18th Mallard Milne Lecture, which this year is entitled Interrelationships Between Practice, Standardization, and Innovation in Geotechnical Earthquake Engineering. And this uh, time, the lecture is delivered by Professor Alain Pecker, um, whom you may have heard of before. And then looking further into the future, on the 14th to the 15th, 15th of September, we have the second 2023 uh, conference, and that takes place in Cambridge, UK this year. So I would encourage you to go on online and look for information about the conference. But back to tonight's event. Uh, tonight, we are joined by Angelo Farnetano, who is a civil engineer chartered both in Italy and in the UK. Angelo has more than 10 years experience in structural and geotechnical design. He's been involved in projects um, that has delivered major infrastructure such as dams, tunnels, uh, for high-speed rail lines, underground stations for metro lines, and now he is employed at Sellafield, where he's now responsible for various, um, or he's responsible for um, technical substantiation of various nuclear facilities. He is a member of Sellafield's geotechnical seismic and extreme hazard team since 2019, and now he is the Geotechnical Center of Expertise lead. So in tonight's event, we turn to Sellafield, which is a large multifunction nuclear site on the west coast of Cumbria in England. And you may well be familiar with Sellafield. Uh, the site covers a large area and comprises more than 200 nuclear facilities and more than 1,000 uh, more than 1,000 buildings. It is Europe's largest nuclear site and has the most diverse range of nuclear facilities in the world on a single site. So in tonight's talk, Angela will talk about a liquefaction assessment 
that was recently completed for Sellafield. Before I hand you over to Angelo, I should just mention that tonight's talk is accompanied by a recent article in the second newsletter. And to read it, just type in second.org.uk forward slash newsletter in your browser, and you should be directed straight to that uh, newsletter. So that, that's all I have to say. I hope you enjoyed tonight's lecture. I will now hand you over to Angelo. Good evening, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Andres, for this introduction. And um, I want to thank you, Seked, and uh, the IC for the opportunity to share this presentation to a big audience. I'm going to share my screen. So hopefully you should be able to see my screen. Um, tonight we talk about the uh, liquefaction assessment we recently completed for the Sellafield side. As Andrea said, we um, published a paper on the second newsletter a few months ago. And uh, tonight we are here to, this, to uh, describe, to talk about that paper, basically. Um, this is the content of the presentation. I will start talking about the Sellafield site, just a little bit of introduction, a little bit of history of the Sellafield site. Um, then we'll talk about soil liquefaction, uh, quickly about soil liquefaction. I want to apologize with the experts which are uh, on the call tonight, but uh, I've tried to make uh, I've tried to make this presentation accessible to everyone. So there will be a little uh, bit of introduction on liquefaction. And then we we'll talk about the ground conditions and seismic hazard for the Sellafield site, the liquefaction vulnerability assessment procedure, the adopted strategy for the Sellafield site, the outcome and the conclusions of this study. As Andrea said, the Sellafield, the Sellafield site is located in West Cumbria on the, on the edge of the Lake District, so um, north west of, northwest of England. And the Sellafield site covers an area of around three square kilometers and is the Europe's largest nuclear site. It has the most diverse range of nuclear facilities in the world on a single site. As a, and as Andrea was saying, um, there are at around 1,300 uh, facilities on the Sellafield site. Uh, there are infrastructure, there are bridges, uh, uh, there is a police station. Uh, Sellafield has got uh, its own uh, water treatment plant. Uh, more than 10,000 people work on this site. So this is just to say that Sellafield uh, is a little town, basically. Um, I want to talk a little bit of the history of the Sellafield site. Um, originally, this area was a farmland. Um, then in 1942, it was selected for the production for the production of uh, uh, TNT during the war. Uh, there, it was uh, a Royal Ordnance Factory was uh, constructed. At the end of the war, of, of course, this uh, uh, factory was uh, decommissioned. But in 1946, that area was selected again by the Ministry of Supply for the production for the production of plutonium and uh, for the nuclear weapons. And this required the construction of nuclear reactors and uh, reprocessing plants. Then on this same area, in 1952, the construction of the world's first nuclear power station with commercial purposes started. And this uh, uh, plant was completed in 1956. And uh, in, on YouTube, you should still be able to find the uh, video of uh, those uh, of when the Queen went on site to open the um, Calder Hall, the power station. Then in 1957, and, uh, a bad event happened, unfortunately, a nuclear incident happened. Uh, one of the worst uh, nuclear incidents ever happened in the world, for sure the worst nuclear in incident happened in the UK. Uh, one of the reactors used for the production of uh, plutonium for the nuclear bomb went on fire, and a large do larger dose of uh, radio radioactivity were uh, released uh, um, across the area. Of course, the, both the nuclear reactors were uh, shut down and uh, 
lots of LFE was uh, taken from uh, that incident, which uh, then uh, um, helped the design of the future uh, uh, nuclear reactors. Um, in 1964, uh, one of the major nuclear facility was built on this site, Magnus. Um, Magnus was a reprocessing plant. Um, what, what is reprocessing? Uh, basically, we can extract from nuclear waste uh, plutonium and uranium. And uh, this is what Magnus was doing, extracting basically uh, plutonium and uranium from uh, waste. Uh, and uh, that uh, material was used uh, again for uh, the production of the nuclear uh, bomb. In 1994, another reprocessing plant was built uh, but this was used uh, mainly for uh, commercial purposes. So uh, nuclear waste from overseas came to the UK and uh, that generated some revenue for the UK. I wanna just say this, uh, when I say um, um, reprocessing plant, uh, you, should, you shouldn't just think about one facility, but uh, there are usually a number of facilities associated with the main plant. Then uh, going on, on uh, 2003, the production of power terminated, Calder Hall was shut down. In 2022, uh, all reprocessing activities terminated. And now the decommissioning of the site, the decommissioning of the site is carrying on. And uh, the government is uh, expecting for uh, these activities to continue for another 100 years. So the site is managed, managed by Sellafield Limited, uh, whose uh, main aim is to decommission the area and to make it a safe place for the future generations. As you can understand, this requires an enormous engineering effort. And the main engineering office of Sellafield is based in uh, Warrington. So that was an, an introduction of uh, Sellafield, uh, the site and the company very quick and short introduction. And uh, let's start about, talk about the assessment tonight. So uh, nuclear safety related structures in the UK, such those seated at Sellafield, are required to be designed to resist extreme hazards, including those associated with the one in 10,000 year probability earthquakes. Liquefaction, as you know, is a seismic associated hazard. Therefore, nuclear sites have to consider it in design. What is soil liquefaction? Soil liquefaction is a physical condition which occurs in saturated, loose, fine grade soils, such as silt and sands, due to buildup of pore pressures during or following intense ground shaking. The buildup of pore pressure causes complete loss of shear strength when it becomes equal to the total stress. So basically when the sigma dot uh, is zero, there is no shear st strength. Um, soil liquefaction doesn't tend to happen in predominantly cohesive soils, gravel, and then sands. Well, this is how we describe soil liquefaction usually. Um, uh, however, uh, soil liquefaction is uh, a very complex uh, mechanism. I want to just mention that uh, there are two types of phenomena. There is a flow liquefaction and a cyclic mobility. Um, I don't want to talk uh, much about this, but just want to show you what happened in laboratory uh, for flow liquefaction. Uh, when the sample uh, has got a uh, high uh, static shear stress applied and uh, it started to be uh, loaded cyclically, cyclically, it can hit the um, flow liquefaction surface and that trigger uh, basically a sudden uh, loss of strength. And this can cause, of course, failure. Whereas the cyclic mobility, when the sample is uh, loaded cyclically, the spheric stress started to reduce until the uh, stress puff uh, hit the Coulomb uh, surface failure. And then the uh, stress puff start going up and down the surface failures. And there are also instances where the uh, effective stress is zero. So that was about liquefaction. Anyway, that was just to say that liquefaction is a very complex phenomenon. A phenomenon. And uh, but what causes soil liquefaction? Uh, soil liquefaction is mostly triggered by seismic actions. It has been observed for earthquakes of magnitude of five or greater than five, and in general for a peak ground acceleration greater than 0.15 g. 
So liquefaction, of course, can be caused also by other sources of vibration. So these are the effects induced by seismic liquefaction, flow failure, sun boils, lateral spreading. Um, if you have watched the presentation on Monday night uh, from the, the presentation arranged by the Astrid T on the evidence it's found on the Turkish uh, earthquake, there were some picture of the effect of liquefaction. There were a picture of sun boils. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, sun boys, lateral spreading, let's say they are, these are uh, ground deformation. Sun boys are little volcanoes that appear on the ground. Uh, flow failures, uh, it tends to happen on an uh, embankment. Um, uh, all, everybody knows uh, what is loss of bearing capacity in settlement. And when there are larger settlements, of course, uh, um, buried structures tend to emerge. So we have said that uh, earthquake liquefaction tend to happen in uh, suns, such, such saturated suns, loose saturated suns, and um, it's triggered by seismic actions, strong seismic action. So let's have a look at the ground condition on the Salafil site. This site is mainly covered by glacial and post-glacial deposits. And this deposit mainly comprise um, granular material which is uh, also silt and sand. And as you can see from this section, which was drawn uh, as a generic section across the side, all those uh, yellow uh, hatches are basically granular material, mainly sand. Uh, these, uh, there are also layers of uh, clay, but uh, let's say superficial deposit in mainly comprise uh, granular material. And this superficial deposit overlie the colder sandstone. Uh, for curiosity, you also see these gray arches at the top of this uh, section. These are uh, um, layers of made ground, as you, can as you can understand. The site has been reworked many times. There is lots of made ground on the Salafil site. So anyway, going back to the point, we do have got sand on the Salafil site. This, uh, this is the groundwater table across the site. So there is the central area where the groundwater table is quite shallow, is uh, within the 15 meter from the surface. Um, the other areas, the, in the other areas, the groundwater table is quite deep. So um, as you can understand, in those areas, we'll not, we don't expect liquefaction, but however, we'll talk about that uh, later on. And this is uh, with regards to the seismic hazard. Yeah, the seismic hazard analysis was carried out in the 80s for the Salafil site. And um, for the one in 10,000 earthquake events, uh, the peak ground acceleration associated with the earthquake of magnitude of 6 is a 0.25 G. However, historically, there has been there was a requirement to assess the performance of uh, structure, system, and components for an acceleration of 0.35 G as well, in order to provide confidence that uh, there, were, there would be no sudden failure uh, for them to perform after the, uh, for them to perform beyond the, the sand basis earthquake. So at Selafil site, basically we've got uh, granular material, uh, we've got um, high ground, we can have high groundwater table and we can have a uh, strong earthquakes. So this is why in the 80s, the liquefaction assessment was carried out and um, low standard penetration test values were found in a small number of boreholes in the central area of the site, which then resulted in a high likelihood of liquefaction for the 0.35 G. Because of the grain size of those layers, which were predominantly coarse material, it was concluded that the liquefaction risk was uh, very low. So these were the charts that were used in the back in the 80s, in the 80s which are not very different to the chart we use, we use today. Um, in 2011, another assessment was carried out for the same area of the site, and then um, using some more updated uh, uh, formulations and uh, they came to the same conclusion. There were uh, layers which were uh, um, 
which resulted in high probability of liquefaction occurrence. But because uh, these were only a few layers, it was concluded that uh, the risk of uh, damage uh, caused by liquefaction was uh, very low. So these were the studies available for the Sellafield site until uh, recently. Um, this is why we decided to update those studies, because uh, as you know, in the last few years, uh, lots of research has been carried out and a lot has, lots has been done on liquefaction. And uh, then we carried out a new assessment. Of course, we didn't follow the provision of the Eurocode 8, because uh, um, as you probably know, those provisions are quite outdated. But uh, we have followed the um, scientific community. The scientific community does, and um, for the liquefaction vulnerability assessment, the assessment comprises three steps. Uh, there is a susceptibility analysis, a triggering analysis, and finally a vulnerability analysis. What is liquefaction susceptibility? Well, with liquefaction susceptibility, we want to understand if. Uh, um, liquefaction can happen. Basically, uh, if that layer, if in that layer liquefaction can be triggered, this is independent of the level of shaking. And uh, if a, a particular soil layer is not susceptible to liquefaction, by definition, liquefaction cannot be triggered. And uh, how do we carry out this analysis? Well, there are some criteria that we can use. There are uh, uh, historical criteria. Has liquefaction already occurred in the past at that location? Geological criteria. Is soil predominantly sandy? Is depth to groundwater le less than 15 meter? Is soil losing state? Is the soil deposit young? There are also compositional criteria. Is the soil uniformly graded? What defines content? Is pl the plasticity index lower than 18? And so on. There are also some state criteria, but these are very complex cri criteria. They require uh, um, complex uh, laboratory analysis uh, in situ tests, uh, and uh, I will not talk about those criteria. So once a soil deposit has been found susceptible to liquefaction, the liquefaction trigger must be investigated. Liquefaction triggering is the initiation of liquefaction from ground shaking. This shaking must be sufficient, sufficiently intense to trigger liquefaction. So how do we carry out this analysis? There are two ways to carry out the liquefaction triggering analysis. There are, there are numerical analysis or simplified methods. We have used the simplified methods. And for each soil layer found susceptible to liquefaction, a factor of safety has to be calculated. The factor of safety against liquefaction is, is the ratio between the cyclic and resistance, resistance ratio, which depends on the soil density and defines content. Uh, soil density can be derived, as you know, uh, by um, using the SPT data or CPT data or um, the shear wave velocity. The cyclic shear ratio um, can be derived using this uh, formula. This formula uh, depends on the uh, peak ground acceleration, the vertical stress, and uh, other factors, um, nonlinear participation factor, magnitude adjustment, and other verbal adjustment. There are a number of um, formulations available in literature to, to work out uh, um, the cycling resistance ratio, the um, nonlinear participation factor, and so on. What is important is to, is to use the, um, the correct formulation. I mean, uh, each SRR formulation is related to specific RD, MSF, and K sigma correlations. So they cannot be, be mixed. And also I showed here, for curiosity, some chart that uh, we still use, we use today. I just wanted you to know that these charts are actually very similar to the chart that I were used in the 80s. However, uh, obviously they've been updated with, more, with other studies. So at the end of the triggering analysis, we can derive a profile of safety factors against liquefaction along the depth of the considered point. So uh, along a specific vertical, we can have a factor safety where is a 
lower than one, this is where liquefaction can happen. And uh, so that, la the, that layer is uh, liquefiable and the where liquefaction is uh, greater than one. So layer is not liquefiable. So how do we assess if that liquefiable layer can cause uh, issues, can cause damage to the surface? Well, to do that, we have to work out the vulnerability parameters. Uh, we have used three parameters for our assessment, the liquefaction potential index, the liquefaction severity number, and the one-dimensional settlement. Um, all these factors mainly depends on the um, factor of safety against liquefaction, Fz and the epsilon V depends on the factor of safety of, uh, against liquefaction. And uh, also depends on this age, which is the depth of soil potentially affected by liquefaction, which is typically around 10, 15, 20 meters maximum. So these are the expressions of those functions. Uh, as you can see, uh, this Fz is one minus the factor of safety of uh, liquefaction if the factor of safety is uh, um, lower than one is zero if the factor of safety is uh, above one, greater than one. And this WZ is a weightening function. Uh, this uh, epsilon V is the post liquefaction volumetric strain, which can be uh, derived using this chart. Uh, as you can see, uh, using the um, SPT block count and the factor of safety for liquefaction, we can derive a post-liquefaction volumetric strain. However, because this chart is uh, a little bit difficult to use, uh, this can be converted uh, in a much simpler chart uh, where you can use uh, the your SPT block count and the factor of safety of liquefaction then work out a post-volumetric strain. You can also, this formulation can be used. So once we have worked out the vulnerability parameters, we can use this table to understand which the effect would be on the, on the surface, to the surface. Mm. The liquefaction probably, the liquefaction potential in the index mainly advise on the likelihood of liquefaction, which may be very low, low, high, very high. The liquefaction severity number and the one-dimensional set, and they give an indication of the effect on the to the surface. So, for example, for a lesson between zero and ten, there are little to no indication of liquefaction. Ten to twenty, minor indication of liquefaction. Moderate indi indication to liquefaction. Thirty to forty, moderate to severe, major indication of liquefaction. Extensive evidence of liquefaction something similar for uh, the one-dimensional assessment, minor cracks, small cracks, large cracks. I want to just say that uh, this one-dimensional uh, um, setum is obviously, a, uh, it has to be seen as an expected setum, but is a, let's say, is a very conservative estimate of the setum that can happen. So what we have done to carry out the assessment, we have used the inform information that contained in 622 boreal logs from across the site. And um, why 622? Well, we had obviously a larger number of boreal holes uh, log available. Um, we have selected the one that had the, that were deeper than 10 meter and that, that had the SPT test included as well. Then use the boreal uh, description data. We have carried out the liquefaction susceptibility analysis. So we have considered um, a soil not, con not susceptible to liquefaction if uh, it was predominantly cohesive, it was a predominantly gravel, where the depth to groundwater was greater than 15 meter, and the if the soil was dense with the um, SPT block on them greater than 30. So after the liquefaction susceptibility analysis, we found that around 500 bore holes were found uh, not susceptible to liquefaction. For the remaining one, we carried out the triggering analysis um, using the information included, the, uh, the SPT information included in the log. 
So this is a map to show where um, um, where we have found uh, boreal uh, suscept area susceptible to liquefaction. As you can see, it's mainly this area where there are these uh, green, red dots. For the rest, is mainly not susceptible to liquefaction, as you can see. So we carried out the triggering analysis um, using these formulations for uh, to work out the uh, factor of safety against liquefaction. Um, to carry out this analysis, we obviously divided the area of the site the, the site in uh, 43 areas where we have assumed the groundwater table to be constant. Uh, this is an example of the spreadsheet that uh, we have uh, um, used. Um, as you can see, um, the last two columns are the, the factor of safety of uh, against liquefaction for uh, 0 0.21, 25 G and 0 0.35 G. Where the factor of safety is 100, it means that uh, that layer is not susceptible to liquefaction. Whatever is lower than one is definitely, um, that layer is liquefiable. So this was the triggering analysis. And then we worked out the vulnerability parameters. And for a 0.25 G, um, for the liquefaction severity number, we have found uh, 604 bore holes, where in the little to no expression to liquefaction. Of course, in these 604 bore holes, we have included also those not uh, susceptible to liquefaction. Then we have found 12 boreholes with a minor expression of liquefaction, two with moderate expression of liquefaction, and one with severe damage. With regards to the liquefaction potential index, we have found that 587 were with a very low probability of liquefaction, uh, 28 with low potential of liquefaction, five with high, and one with very high. So these are the maps of the site. Um, as you can see, these are, this is the area where we have found the highest values. Um, this is the liquefaction potential index. So this is a zoom for that uh, central area. And as you can see, there are uh, um, one, two, three, four in this area with high probability of liquefaction here and one here with the very high probability of liquefaction. Something similar we have found for the uh, liquefaction severity number. Uh, again, this was the area where the highest values were uh, obtained. This is a zoom for that area. Um, as you can see, there are two uh, boreholes with the uh, moderate expression of liquefaction, and here one with the uh, uh, severe damage. These are the results for 0.35G. Um, again, the majority were of 588 with little to no expression of liquefaction, 27 with minor expression of liquefaction, 3 with moderate expression of liquefaction, and 1 with major and 1 with severe damage. With regards to the liquefaction potential index, the majority was, was for a very low um, liquefaction potential, uh, 35 with low liquefaction potential, 90 with high, and 3 with very high. Again, these are the maps of the side. This is for the liquefaction potential index, 0.35G. Again, the central area is where we have recorded the highest values. This is a zoom of that area. As you can see, there are a few um, boreholes with high probability of liquefaction, two here with the very high, here one high with the very high, and uh, a couple with the high probability of liquefaction. Again, something similar for the liquefaction severity number. And that zoom for the central area. In here, there are uh, three with the moderate expression of liquefaction, one with the severe damage, one with severe damage on this side as well. So what we have found is that uh, 
both the liquefaction potential index and the liquefaction severity number have shown a good agreement in predicting, in predicting the liquefaction vulnerability. And uh, they've uh, provided the highest value in a small area of the site. So for this small area of the site, we have decided to work out the um, one-dimensional settlement. This is an area of around 300 meter by 150 meter, just to um, give you some numbers. And this is what we have found. So uh, for that area, uh, the majority were with the little to no damage, minor cracks, 47 for 0.25 G, 41 for 0.35 G. Uh, seven with the small cracks for 0.25 G and 12 with the small cracks for uh, 0.35 G. One with the extensive damage for 0.25 G and two uh, for 0.35 G. So this is what we have found. This is what the vulnerability parameters um, tell us. Um, uh, we have to say that these vulnerability parameters have been uh, um, derived. I mean, this uh, um, damage to surface, this damage to buildings have been uh, observed over, I would say, normal buildings. Um, uh, structure and infrastructure on the Selafis site are very robust. Uh, uh, structure are very uh, well engineered. So we think that uh, should uh, a liquefaction happen, the, um, effect of that liquefaction would be even lower than the, these uh, uh, parameters suggest. Therefore, this is what uh, we have concluded for um, uh, the 10 to the minus 4 uh, design basis here to a 0.25 G. There is a very low risk of uh, uh, building infrastructure damage occurring everywhere uh, over the Selafield site. For the extreme earthwork event, the 0.35 G, the historic refaction is uh, very low uh, for the majority of the site, over 95% of the Selafield site. There is a small area of the site, the central area, where the, there is a risk of liquefaction, but the risk, uh, we, we consider that risk to be low again, uh, because the um, structure and infrastructure on the Selafield site are very robust. And, uh, we don't expect any damage, to be honest. However, should settlement be a concern for any future proposed safety-related facility in this area, then a special measure may be required, such as a ground improvement. And this is it uh, for uh, my presentation. Thank you for your attention. And um, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen. Okay. Well, thank you very much, um, Angela. That was uh, very interesting to follow. Um, thank you, Andres. So far, I have no questions in the inbox from the attendees. Um, however, while we're waiting for questions to arrive, and I would encourage people to post their questions um, at this point in time, uh, I might have a, a question or two, if, if I may. Um, yeah. So you, you you went through some of the theory that underpins the liquefaction assessments that you've carried out um, on Sellafield site. And one thing that struck me is that the formulas still appear to be dependent on the peak ground acceleration. How good do you think the peak ground acceleration is as a as an indicator of the potential in an earthquake to cause liquefaction? Is it a reliable indicator or should we maybe look at more sophisticated measures? Well, that's a very good question. Um, I think the peak ground acceleration is a simple parameter to use, but um, yeah, probably we should look at more uh, sophisticated means, uh, probably the number of cycles is something that we should uh, take into account as well. But uh, what I think is that, uh, is that uh, the peak ground acceleration is a very simple parameter to use and that uh, is something that can be um, 
understood easily by um, engineers that can be used um, easily by engineers. So uh, where even though I think this is this is a simplified approach is something that can be understood by everyone. So um, I don't know if that makes sense. So I, at times I would prefer to keep th th things simple rather than, than complicated and uh, accessible to everyone. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah, it does. Yeah, thank I, you very I, do, much. I do agree with you. I do agree with you, but uh, um, in my opinion, at times probably uh, maybe we should keep things simple. I have uh, a few other questions from the audience. Um, I have um, a question from Mobin Ogahi, and their question is. If you had to do ground improvement under a building, how would you do it? And what would be different for a nuclear site? Um, how would you do it? Um, well, I would say, I would say, um, I would need to have a thing, but what, what, what comes to my mind, I would definitely do, a, what, what comes to my mind, we could definitely do a, an injection of a, uh, cement of uh, jet grouting to improve the strength of that uh, liquefiable layer. Uh, what will be difficult for what will be different for a nuclear site? I don't think much. I mean, the aim would still be to um, basically make that layer non liquefiable. So I don't think there much be there should be any difference from another site to another site. I have another question from Mike Stevenson. And Mike asks, has any similar assessment to this uh, used at Sellafield site been carried out for either existing nuclear power stations or proposed uh, power stations such as Sizewell C? To be honest, I don't know. To be honest, I don't know. Um, I would expect so. Um, I mean, as I said, the nuclear facilities in the UK are required to resist extreme hazards. So uh, I would expect that uh, a sort of assessment against liquefaction uh, um, should have been carried out. But to be honest, I've never been involved in those assessments, so I can't respond. Yes, uh, I, I would agree with your response that in general it is a hazard that is considered uh, for all nuclear sites and. In some cases, it's straightforward to disregard or dismiss the hazard as um, having any potential to occur because of the ground conditions. But in other cases, for other sites, quite comprehensive. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly, exactly. The assessment could be uh, very easy in the sense that uh, if you if your site is uh, founded on a rock, you can just say, yeah, it's founded on rock, so no liquefaction. But yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, the next question comes from Francisco Jose Reña, and I do apologize for my uh, pronunciation uh, if, if it's wrong. Um, Francisco is also associated with uh, Sellafield, and his uh, question is, could you explain why the Eurocode's liquefaction, liquefaction assessment is outdated? Well, well, could explain is um, is a very no is a very old uh, procedure which is described in the Euro code. Is um, well, obviously, obviously, liquefaction probably is the is the topic where the um, in the recent year where the, the research has advanced a lot and a lot has been published. Uh, I think probably after the Christchurch event uh, in two thousand eleven. Um, and uh, the liquefaction severity number was derived after the Christchurch 11, for example, event in, uh, for example, in, uh, in New Zealand. And uh, probably Eurocode has managed to keep up to, so has not been updated. And um, it, still, it still has got a very simple procedure, which is very similar to the one that uh, was carried out in the 80s. Um, but hopefully, hopefully will be updated soon and they will uh, include what is uh, done, uh, uh, I would say, uh, now across the world from among the engineering and the scientific community. So following those three steps and uh, using those uh, vulnerability parameters um, 
uh, which at the moment are not included in the euro code mm -hmm. yes the next question comes from ing smith who uh, works for atkins and his question is are the structures in the sensitive areas of uniform layout and squat i.e would they sink in a relatively controlled manner as has been seen for some places in the world uh, can you repeat new? yeah so the question is uh, are the structures on site are they of uniform layout and squat in construction so as to ensure that they would sink if, if liquefaction were to occur would they then sink in a relatively controlled manner so the whole building might just settle by a few millimeters or centimeters um and ian points out that this has been observed in some places in the world yeah i would say so i would say so obviously when we design a building at sellerfield we obviously take into account a different aspect we tend to design them to uh, resist extreme hazard and to be resilient and obviously if uh, any settlement uh, would happen to to make it uh, basically absorbable by by the structure um so i would say so i would say so um however however as i said uh, during my presentation we to be honest we don't expect for the selfie site any uh, major settlement to be honest and uh, if any settlement should occur uh, yeah, they should be absorbed by the structure and uh, yeah, probably settle in a uniform way without uh, any differential uh, displacement, any uh, structural issue for, uh -huh. the, for the building. Yeah. I guess the question then is still, uh, what about the services connected to the building? If they don't sink in the same uniform manner, you could have a pipeline or a a trench that connects to the building yeah yeah, yeah, oh. I, I, yeah I, I didn't respond correct i mean uh, yeah when i say when i say we tend to to, to design the building uh, to be resilient of, of course i i include all the services which are attached to the building because oh, yes, we, want, yes, yes. Yeah, we want to make it uh, um we want to make it uh, um we want to make it, keep it operational even after the seismic event. So this is this is what I meant with the resilience. So definitely, definitely, uh, it would accommodate the settlement. Yes, thank you. Um, the next question comes from Mariola um, Shilinska, who is also uh, employed by Atkins. And their question is: Have you compared the SPT-based predictions with CPT? and shear wave velocity based methods no not really no not really i mean not for this assessment not for this assessment we have only used the spt information we've got we haven't got uh, many cpt um data for the cellophile site mainly because uh on the cellophile side there is lots of made ground uh, so there are lots of boulders and uh, we cannot really carry out the the cpt test and uh, we haven't uh, we have we have we have got we have got some uh, um, shear strength velocity, but um, not not for those locations where we have carried out the assessment. So in the end, no, no. Yeah. The next question comes from Shaheen Husseinli, uh, who is affiliated with the University of Bristol, and their question is um well first of all um hello angelo and andreas thank you for the presentation and the question is what are you planning to do about the vulnerable regions well as, as i said as i said we don't think is uh, very vulnerable to be honest because um uh, even uh, even if uh, some settlement should occur the the vulnerability parameter uh, suggests that uh, the effect should be only minors and as as i said during the presentation because of the structure and infrastructure on the cellular side are on average much more robust than uh, um, normal buildings i would say i would expect that those effects 
predicted by those vulnerability parameters would be even lower, even lower. So I, I don't expect any issue. However, I, I, as I, I was concluding in uh, my, my presentation, uh, if in that area uh, in future we will uh, build a nuclear sensitive uh, related structure, we will definitely do something in the sense that we'll definitely carry out uh, for sure a ground investigation and we'll carry out a more specific assessment for that area. And again, if we confirm that that area is, uh, let's say, vulnerable to liquefaction, we may carry out a ground improvement. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Martin Saunders from Jacobs has a question. In regards to settlement predictions of ground with reference to liquefaction potential, was this considered? And if so, how was this undertaken? And how was the site over how was the site's overall potential considered based on differences between boreholes? Um, uh, the, 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 the only is uh, the only settlement prediction we have carried out the only is um, just uh, working out the one uh, dimensional uh, settlement which was one of the vulnerability parameter um, again as said during the presentation that uh, settlement is a conservative uh, even I would say very conservative estimate of the final uh, settlement over the area uh, however, so we have used that information as a, uh, let's say, average settlement across the area. Again, I just want to stress that uh, that is a conservative estimate. And uh, that estimate was around, for the 0.25G, was around 5, 6 centimeters, which will follow basically in the lower, uh, um, uh, in the basically minor or no uh, um, issue to the buildings in within the, the, the table provided uh, um, for the one dimensional settlement uh, um, parameter and for the for the point 35g the average settlement across the area was around uh, seven eight centimeter which was a uh, small cracks i think uh -huh. so this is this is this is the only assessment we have found we have done for uh settlement again i want to set i want to stress that that's that uh um, prediction is very conservative, but uh -huh. again, we still think that uh, if we look at that table, we the the feeling we get is that the yes, the, the settlement and the the effect should be neg negligible. Yes. Okay. Thank you for the, the answer. We have still have a few more questions to get through, so I hope you are still uh, yeah. um, happy to respond. Um, the next question comes from Evangelos Yefantitis, who is also affiliated with Atkins. And the first comment by Evangelos is, we are a big group here, which presumably refers to the many questions from Atkins employees. Uh, then he goes on to the main question. Uh, what is the best means of mitigating mitigation risk, mitigating risk is liquefaction a phenomenon that is typically very localized? Um, and what foundation type is typical for cellar fields? So I think there are three questions here, really. So first of all, what is the best means of mitigate, mitigating risk? Second question is, uh, is liquefaction a phenomenon that is typically very localized? And the third question refers to the foundations types typically seen in cellar field. And I'm happy to remind you what about yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so, so, so anyway, um, I start with the, the last one, which is one determinant. Uh, foundation solutions. Well, um, well, I would say it depends on the building. We have got uh, large varieties of buildings, large varieties of structures. Um, uh, for steel structure, it may be part foundation, and there is a uh, bearing a slab uh, which span across the area. So it it's literally depends on the building. Which uh, Anyway, Zelda field, there are not only nuclear safety related structures, but there are other number of structures which are maybe only normal structures. As I said before, there is a, a police station, there is also a post office. So it depends on which buildings are we talking about. Um, 
so can be everything, can be piled foundation, raft foundation, depends which buildings are we talking about. Uh -huh. Of course, as, as, you, as you can imagine, these foundations are designed to satisfy the requirements of that building. Often, often we've got uh, very stringent uh, uh, differential settlement requirements. Uh, this is what happened often. And uh, we tend to use uh, piled foundation or we tend to use raft foundation, but again, this was this is just to give you a reload thumb, but uh, it really depends on what building are we talking about. Yes. Um, then the other question was about mitigation of liquefaction. I think the first. Yes. Question. What is the yeah. of mitigating risk? Um, again, we, we don't see we don't see for the Sellafield side um, any major risk and any major. Uh, um, um, issue for liquefaction. Again, if uh, something, uh, if we um, see that um, there may be a problem, we what we could think is to, as I said before, inject some uh, cement to do some jet grouting to uh, improve the, st the sheer strength of that uh, um, soil layer. Um, uh, anyway, we haven't got we haven't got anything. We haven't thought uh, specifically about anything. It's something that will have to be designed specifically for uh, what we'll have to be doing. And um, and then the, the final question is: uh, liquefaction is liquefied. So liquefied. Uh, is it typically very localized in nature? If it does happen, is this is the. Uh, uh, I guess I guess this is a general question for the not just for the Sellafield site. site is uh, something that. Uh, well, it, it can be or it cannot be. Uh, it really depends. For example, for uh, talking about uh, Christchurch again, that there was a, um, in New Zealand in 2011, that was an extensive uh, uh, evidence of liquefaction, that uh, there is basically uh, that uh, town, that city is very close to a river and which is very close to uh, the sea as well. And uh, there is that valley, which is... Uh, uh, alluvial material with very high groundwater table and uh, that is when the liquefaction happens. Strong earthquake in this uh, valley with this loose uh, material. Um, so extensive, depends how big is that area. Uh, so as long as uh, as long as long uh, that area is, uh, is small, can be small, but if that area is big, uh, liquefaction can be everywhere. I think, I think, maybe Andreas, correct me if, if I'm wrong, but probably I'm talking about uh, again a crisis for the crisis charge for that event. Uh, most of the damages were caused by liquefaction, as far as I remember. So, moving on then to the next question from Rafael de Risi from the University of Bristol, and <laughs> I think you know each other. Uh, his question: or First of all, he says, "Hi, Angelo. Congratulations on this nice presentation." Uh, this is Raphael from Bristol. Have you considered the possibility of using empirical models to compute settlements and lateral spreading? Uh, we haven't. We haven't because, as I said, um, we we don't expect liquefaction to be an issue. But um, if in if in future we would see. Uh, we, would, we, we will see this to be a problem. We may ever think about that. Okay. And then the next question, which I think is the second last question, um, comes from, again, from Shaheen Husseinli from the University of Bristol. And the question is, have you also analyzed or planning to do analysis of the soil structure interaction, SSI effect? Uh, uh, in, in the, yeah, yeah. we have got, uh, I, am, I work in a CSNA capability, which is the civil structure and architectural section of Sellafield. This is our, my department. Within my department, there is also an analysis team. That analysis uh, team obviously carried out a seismic analysis and they do take into account the soil structure interaction when they design buildings, when uh, when the building is located in a particular area of the site where uh, 
the site structure interaction is important. So we do we do have got that capability, and we do take into account size the soil structure interaction in our design. Um, for uh, for this assessment, uh, no, this assessment was uh, only a uh, liquefaction assessment. So this is what uh, we have done. So, so not not any. Uh, further analysis apart from what I've shown here. Right, last question before we wrap up uh, comes from Raphael again. Um, also, have you considered the possibility of propagating any uncertainty with a probabilistic approach? Uh, we had a thought about that. We had a thought about using a probabilistic approach, but that was only only um, uh, for for, uh, for a day, and then we we went back to the, the deterministic approach. Uh, so um, I would say the answer is no. We had a thought about that, but only only very quickly, and then we used the deterministic approach mainly because, uh, um, well, as far as uh, as far as. Uh, um, we know is the most uh, used across the scientific community. And um, uh, anyway, the nuclear industry, as you probably know, we always have to use uh, something that is more uh, um, proven to be, anyway, what is used uh, widespread rather than doing something that is more uh, in a niche. Uh, uh -huh. Anyway, I may be wrong. I may be wrong in the sense that uh, uh, maybe, maybe the probabilistic approach is... Uh, uh, widespread as the deterministic approach, but we felt that the deterministic approach was more uh, um, appropriate for our study. So, no, we didn't. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Uh, I have a little bit of feedback from Ian Smith, who previously asked about settlement of buildings. And he points out that in the extreme, settlement can be a few meters, according to Ian's experience. And he says, yes, you're exactly right regarding uh, the services that come into a building. They are quite uh, critical. Um, Vipul Kumar from Mott McDonald thanks us, uh, thanks you for the presentation. And then he has a somewhat longer question, which I think I'll forward to you via email. And if, if you then want, if you have time, yeah, uh, you no may problem. just respond directly to, to Vipul. Um, and again, there are other people who just thank you for the presentation. And I would also like to thank you, Angelo, on behalf of SECIT and SECIT's members for a very interesting uh, presentation tonight. Uh, thank you for taking the time to join us. And um, um, yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. It, was, uh, it has been a pleasure. And with that, I think we'll close uh, tonight's um, uh, evening lecture. I would also like to thank the audience for tuning in and uh, for the questions. It's been a very uh, interesting evening, and I hope it continues to be a pleasant evening for everyone involved. Thank you, and uh, good evening. Thank you, everyone.